Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Show podcast. Now, there's one or two people that I've come across in the last 10 years that I have, one, enormous respect for, two, just, you know, I'm, I, I just use them as reference points. I use them to keep me grounded so that if I hear of some amazing new technology or a breakthrough in battery design or some new uh, brilliant uh, piece of social engineering that allows uh, further integration of renewables into a city or a townscape, I always want to check with a few people just to see how uh, much I'm being swept along by the hype or how much of that is real. And this uh, next guest of this week, who will be on the Fully Charged show more than once, believe me, is uh, from Eindhoven in the Netherlands, uh, which is where he teaches. His name is Alka Hoekstra. Probably got that slightly wrong, but it's along those lines. And when uh, <laughs> it was so amusing, the day that I recorded the interview with him, my wife was discussing my lockdown beard, because this is the, the longest I've ever grown a beard, and it's not terribly impressive, not going to lie. It is getting a bit longer. I'm probably going to get rid of it soon. But, you know, that's... she, And she quite likes it. She wasn't being critical. When you see a picture of Urka, you will see why this is uh, relevant, because he has some considerable beard. Not only that, he has a much more considerable brain and an insight and a knowledge and an academic uh, uh, analysis of the transition, the energy transition we're going through, the transportation transition we're going through, a really good, well-founded, optimistic but realistic appraisal of the struggles, challenges and massive, massive optimistic opportunities that we have ahead of us uh, in the next few years. So really inspiring, uplifting talk. Very broad ranging. He's a, just a fascinating man. Uh, really want to get him on the podcast again, to, you know, with a few more really specific questions because he knows stuff very, very well. Um, <clears throat> that's it, really. Before we start that, here's a little message from our glorious, wonderful and s simply gorgeous sponsor. My Energy is putting the I back into British innovation. My Energy is putting the I back into inventing the future. My Energy is putting the I back into inspiring a nation. Recharging the world with green smart energy. Charge your EV with your PV and more. Visit myenergy.com and help to spark the green revolution. My Energy. Driving the charge to a greener future. Okay, thank you so much for, for supporting the, uh, the Fully Charged Show podcast. Really, really good to know that we can keep going with this particular uh, avenue of our output. Uh, that's it. So let's get on with the show. Let us welcome to the Fully Charged Show podcast. Didn't say charged very well then, did I? I'll do that a bit again. Let's welcome to the Fully Charged Show podcast, Urka Hoekstra. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, your background, because people talk about backgrounds, that's a proper intellectual's background. That's a, I have bookcases, but they're in another room. <laughs> but that's imp I'm impressed. <laughs> yes, yeah, and it's, it's, uh, it's also very handy to have them. Uh, well, at near hand, right? yeah. So in, in a study, uh, study room, it's not. Yeah. Not a bad thing to have your books, but they also look nice as a background. They do. They look very good. But now I just want you to give a, a brief background of how you got to where you are today, because basically I want our listeners to know that I, I hear something uh, on the Internet or someone sends me a link or I read something and I go, oh, not sure about that. Then I wait for you to comment on it. <laughs> That's And I go, ah. Oh, okay. And sometimes I've, I'm proud to say I've come to the same conclusion, but quite often I haven't even thought about it in the ways you do. So you you have an extraordinary insight into the the topic that we're discussing. But I mean, essentially, I guess the decarbonisation, electrification of transport, and the and the circular economy and renewable energy and those that whole area is your. You know, I definitely look up to you and. And, and, uh, and well, thank you very much. 
Yeah. I, I never thought that was, this would happen. 15 years ago, I took a sabbatical because I wanted to do something, something else with the next part of my life. The first part was internet and all that sort of stuff. Right. And I found out that uh, solar, wind, um, batteries, and thus electric vehicles, um, hydrogen, basically all the puzzle pieces we needed to solve the energy crisis, they were developing at a very predictable pace right. and, and going in the right direction. But I hadn't read that anywhere or something, or, or I, I discovered that while I was doing some research into what else can I do with the rest of my life that will right. use. And then I found like, wow, oh my God, oh, oh, this is going to be the same thing as with internet, as with PCs, all those the smartphones, all those other um, uh, transformations that I've yeah. been part of. I thought it's going to be 20 years or something before people realize this, because that's how long it takes before yeah. it comes clear, if you study it, to everybody knows it. So I think yeah. that's what I should be focusing on. So basically, that's what I've been doing for the last 15 years, trying to get the message out that there's a lot of, basically, technologies that we could integrate into our lives that could make this whole nightmare go away and actually make life more fun. So yeah. the, the good news, please embrace it, people, because yes. then we can <laughs> embrace some species, we can, we can save some species, and a lot of uh, a lot of climate migrants will, will thank us for us. At, uh, at, 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 it's this yeah. serious stuff, but it's also a very positive message. So that's what I found out 15 years ago. And basically, I've been employed by a lot of, the, uh, written a couple of books about it, uh, employed by a lot of people. And five years ago, I ended up seven years ago at the Technical University of Eindhoven. Yeah. So that's where I'm currently at. And uh, two years ago, I started a program there and I got funded. Yes, yes, right. yes. With 35 people basically researching all the things you just described. Right, right. So now I have some expert at my disposal, uh, apart from my own uh, curiosity into digging things out. And I'm not very good at, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit on the spectrum, as they say, so I'm not really good at, I'm not a, a movie star kind of, kind of, kind of guy who, who <laughs> immediately gets what he has to say to come across. But I did find out that there's a sort of, um, a need almost uh, a want at least in society for uh, for for good information about electric yeah. vehicles and I, I i yeah i try to fill that niche yeah i mean because that the, the i think the the way i came across your work and what you've been doing strangely enough was through australia was the solar car challenge that the eindhoven university I, I actually think, I, and I cannot remember when I did this, but I did a report for the BBC, so not for Fully Charged, for a, a BBC show about the, the solar team Eindhoven, the, the team that okay. built that, that have now gone on to start up light year Thank cars you. and all that stuff. So I was in Eindhoven a year before last to, to see it, to working with them. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that it is an extraordinary place because of the, the clearly the students it attracts and then who've gone on to do things from that. It is that. a and really it, nice place with yeah. lots of student teams and there's lots of large companies like NXP, um, if you know, them, they make uh, a lot of embedded chips, maybe even the most embedded chips in the world are there. Right. Uh, the guys who make the, the apparatus that make solar panels, for example, also there. Wow. So there's, there's a whole lot of high tech. Uh, yeah, uh, industries. You know and Philips, things. you know, yes. all day. I mean, we know Philips, right? I mean, it's, yeah. Less famous now, but it used to be a really she, big company, this, like like yeah, GM or something, yeah. right? And uh, and Philip started there in Eindhoven, become very big in Eindhoven. I didn't realize it started there because we filmed at that time. At, are still there, but right. now under different names and leadership. Yeah, yeah. Because we filmed at the at a, a stunningly beautiful house that was the Phillips family home. I think a th big thatched mansion i mean it's an amazing place there's nothing like it in the uk it's absolutely unique to the it Netherlands. Is a very, it was also voted uh, the smartest uh, square kilometer on earth a couple of years ago. Was it? <laughs> so so i mean uh, you also have this sort of stuff of course in singapore or, yeah. or in, in, in in silicon valley but it's yeah. a really nice place yeah and people are not you know um how, how can i say it that then they're, they're not trying to get ahead at the cost of of, of anything they're, they're yes. very normal nice laid back i would say people very friendly yeah so so i will not compare the other places that i have now in mind where it's different but yeah yeah a lot of places where people are much more i don't know 
Well, sort of co- competitive and backstabbing, exactly. and yeah, exactly. no, yeah. no, definitely not. It's not a. But the the um, the thing that I think so then we probably both had a, a vague experience like this when I first came across an electric car, which was actually in the early two thousands. It made I didn't think, oh, this is amazing. This is the future, or anything. I didn't even. I didn't understand why they'd done it. I thought it was quite an interesting experiment. So this was some engineers I met. I used to make a, a TV series called Scrap Heap Challenge where, you know, uh, oh, two yeah, teams yeah, yeah. built things. Yeah. And uh, it was when I was in America working on that that I met these uh, a small group of engineers that were working on an electric car. And it was kind of, you know, it was intriguing, but it wasn't like um, I didn't go, of course, you know. For a long time, I went, oh, I don't know why they did that. It didn't sound very good. Oh. You know, so I was completely in a combustion engine mindset. That's what I'd grown up with. And it really took a long time. But what I never thought, and, and this shows my, in a sense, political naivety, that there would be a reaction against it or that there would be anything that would stop it. it you know, once I understood, oh, I see, it's got a battery, an electric motor, and, a, and it's more efficient. How much energy does it use to go along a kilometre? Oh, much less. Not a yeah, bit less. Yeah. Much less. less. Does anything come out the back? No. <laughs> How can you make the electricity? Need, right? You can make it from solar panels or wind turbines. Yeah. Oh, you know, that stuff. I got all that. Took me a while. I'm sure you got it quicker. But I didn't see the reaction, you know, the, obviously the corporate reaction from the oil industry and the car manufacturers, which was pretty vicious. I mean, could you see that before <laughs> before it we became aware of it because i know that's one thing you spend well, time back yeah i've, I've come from this uh, at this from a little bit different perspective because yeah. i was looking for solutions to world problems right like two, and um yeah how it felt for example to drive it or if anybody had made it yet or that sort of stuff for me that was like, I don't know. Um, secondary or not important. Secondary, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It was not that important. For me, what was important is basically, can we get off fossil fuels? Is that doable? Is that possible? And then I thought, oh, oh, oh. And exactly all the things you said were basically, for me, the reasons to look into it. So right. for me, it was first, I was convinced by the stuff that you just described, like it's a three or four times more efficient, Use just batteries that you can make from uh, from anything. Basically, you can produce the batteries also on renewable energy, of course, and yeah. then the whole process becomes renewable. So I sort of was like, ah, oh. and then I went looking for how how will this play out, and I found out things like learning curves. We've I mean, you've come probably come come across them like uh, not solar panels. Every time you double. The number of solar panels, uh, uh, the the price of the solar panels goes down by twenty yeah. percent. There's a very predictable, even called Swanson's law now. Right, I have there's, heard there's of that. There's also yeah. very predictable stuff like that going on with batteries. So basically, fifteen years ago, I could predict how expensive the cars would be now, and I wasn't that far off. Actually. Right. It's, it's so if you know the basics, you can predict these sort of things. And then I came looking and found all those petrol heads saying, "No, yeah. people will never embrace this. This yeah. is this is this is lunacy." And all the oil companies basically laughing at us. And yeah. and and in the first, I, I could give speeches, for example, um, at conferences, etc. After I've written books, so that was 40 years ago or something. And I was always very welcome as the you know the nice guy who brings this new perspective and uh, give him a round of applause and uh, pat him on the back. But don't take them seriously. Of course. Yeah. We know how these things work. <laughs> it, but it's funny, you know? Yeah. And now it's very different. So, yeah. and, and now we also see, for example, in Germany, uh, uh, a lot of pushback, a lot of people who are not happy that their internal combustion engine is challenged. Yeah. And as we saw Aston Martin uh, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and Bosch, who makes a lot of stuff for combustion engines, not being happy that how this is playing out. Yeah. But some things, fortunately, um, are not influenced too much by politics or whatever. Some things, if you have a better technology, if you have LED lights, they will simply take over. Yeah, yeah. You can you can shout what you want, but it's a superior te- superior technology. Yeah, yeah. And I think the same thing is happening with solar, wind, uh, electric vehicles. Fortunately. Yes. Yeah. Because I mean that uh, there may be, I'm sure there'll be people listening who aren't aware of that. But that story, when those stories come out. And I mean, you know, you've got to hand it 
in a way, to the, the, you know, quite genius manipulation of data and f- sort of vague facts that you just steer your way around. I mean, the great one that we still haven't done, we did, we've recorded an episode about tyre particulates, about, you know, microplastics, about the PM25, 2.5 that comes off tyres, you know, which is all f- a real research, uh, well carried out. And ha- there is a really important point there in that if you have, and it, it's amazing how I, I how stupid I am, but I never thought about it. You know, you you have a vehicle, you drive it, the tires wear down. Oh, I've got to buy new tires. That's as far as my logical thing went. Not where did the stuff that was on the tires that's worn down go? <laughs> never occurred yeah. to me. Yeah, and, yeah. But but what one research company in the UK did was worked out that it was I think four point two or four point three grams of particulates were worn off the tire every kilometer. And I hear that and I go, oh, that's terrible. You know, that's not awful. Uh, you know, and you think that's not, you know, each kilometer is a tiny amount. And it makes sense until someone worked out that if you drive for 5,000 kilometers using that calculation, after 5,000 kilometers, you've used 19 times the weight of the entire tire, the whole tire, everything, the walls, everything. <laughs> has completely you're driving along on the steel rims you know the, the calculations were so far out but you re, if you don't follow it logically and that's how they so then every newspaper in the uk or tires particulates from tires make electric cars worse than diesel you know that's exactly, the headline exactly exactly yeah which is just that's, the, that's one of the next things uh, I'm, I'm i have to probably combat the coming years yes yeah. On the other hand, I must say that uh, if everybody gets an SUV and yeah. you make it electric, then you it's can not. bring CO2 down, yeah. but you will need an awful lot of uh, resources. To and build the damn sure things. That, that that's the, the, the safest and, and fun, funnest city to live in. So yeah. I, 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 I actually agree with the people who say, um, yeah, electric vehicles are part of the solution. They're clearly better oh, than yeah. vehicles. But, um, yeah, biking is still a lot better for, for the city, better. of course. I can't remember. I mean, I've, wrote, I've cycled all my life, and I can't remember, and now I've done it, but, you know, having to replace my bicycle tires because they've worn out. I mean, you do, no. but it's once every seven or eight years. And, exactly, you know, exactly. It's not exactly. Like, and they're, they're very lightweight tires, so yeah. that, that's nothing. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. And also, of course, in terms of how many how much resources you need. I mean, a, a, a bicycle weighs twenty kilos. Yeah. A gar, car weighs up to two thousand kilos or something. Yeah. That's yeah. a lot more. Yeah. So yeah. So I all also have this idea of, and I, I, I actually I'm not sure how to how to do this to 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 try to tell people, look, we have new technologies that can basically solve a lot of problems, but we should do more than just replace old sh- with new. Sh- yeah. We should also look at, I mean, who, who told us that, that who, whoever dies with the most toys wins, as, as, as Garfield uh, once put it, you know? Yes. Well, what, what kind of life goal is that? Yeah, yeah. Right? So, so I would love, and I see this, by the way, in the younger generation a, a lot, that they yeah. ask themselves, what is my purpose in life? Uh, 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 I should be doing more than just making money. In a way, it's a luxury, of course, that, you, that the money is given or that yeah. you have enough to eat is a given but now how am i going to make meaning out of this yeah. and they're very interested in how the whole system works and how the system can be improved so i see electric vehicles as a step towards an improved system and, yeah. and not as uh you know as a solution Absolutely. Exactly. yeah yeah no i mean that was that one thing i am proud of which i got it early on because in the same way on a prob- very different level i've been giving public talks and corp you know talking to corporations and well, you know, i do after- level in, this, in the sense that more people listen to you so no, I don't, think so. don't be too modest <laughs> It's on a it's on a more simplistic uh, emotional level, is it less less? But but the thing that I always started was with the, when I did those talks is electric cars won't save the world; they're not the solution. You know that's the but what, you know my argument but which is better. Let's never but they are better, better technology. It's a better technology, <laughs> exactly. absolutely. Exactly. But the, my argument has always been that in a sense they uh, they open a door. So I never thought about I never thought about where petrol came from. And that included the fact that I, because of my work, I had filmed for two days in an oil refinery. 
I still, even after that, I didn't think, where does petrol come from? I then understood, uh, you know, at a, at a rudimentary level, how we produce all the, the different products out I, of crude I really, oil. I really like this, how you, how you arrive at everything, uh, I don't know, in a, in a very tangible, emotional, like, like, like you experience it, you connect with it kind of way. Yeah. And I'm the typical academic who, who sort, of, sort of first thinks out the theory and then goes looking for some experiences or something to, to sort of yeah. make sure that the understanding I got is also an experience. But I think it, I think it took me years before I drove my first electric vehicle, actually. Right, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, I'm not sure I had driven one when I wrote my first book about them. Right. So for me, it's really about, you know, first principles and then uh, the, the practical the, stuff. And that's not the best way to connect to an audience. I, any, any, I don't <laughs> think I it's, I, I, I think we have to both acknowledge that both our experiences are valid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, it's very important. <laughs> Because I think it's, you know, what I always lacked was that sort of analytical ability. And, that, and it took me years to work that out. You know, this, I'm in an oil refinery. Look at the size, look how much oil goes in. Oh, and that, one of the key things that's really stayed with me that did when I realized it like months later, when we parked our cars, when we went to visit this place, we parked our cars in the, guest, the visitor's car park. And opposite us was what I would call a substation, a large electricity substation very big it's uh, yes. industrial scale yes. and i thought to myself and i think i might have said to the director oh i didn't know they also generated electricity when they made <laughs> when they uh, refined fuel because that's what it looked like it looked like where electricity started from because it had big yes. uh, yes. electricity pylons going off into the distance and it was while we were interviewing the head engineer, they amazing people were running this place. That they, he told me it's the equivalent of two large uh, uh, English cities, the amount of electricity they use to refine. Use, exactly. Yeah, use. They use yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So that was a connection from, um, here's the beautiful irony of the wonders of the fossil fuel industry, because they needed a guaranteed supply. This thing is running 24 hours a day. They don't connect to the grid, to the national grid with all the complexity. They have a direct feed from one power station, and that power station burns coal. So 100% of their electricity supply is from coal, yeah. <laughs> which is if you, just... If you take that into my calculations, yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes yeah. it worse again. Because for... that was, I mean, that was often my argument, and it was such a hard thing to get because I... Wish I'd known what I know now when I was filming there. It's very hard now to get permission. I've asked since. Can we come? <laughs> can we come are. and do a, a hugely <laughs> critical a documentary about your industry? But how how many kilowatt hours of electricity are embedded in, say, a, a, a liter of, of petroleum? I mean, it won't be. It's not a kilowatt hour. You know, it's less than that. But there is some. But it's yeah, such there, there, a hard actually, thing. Actually, to, actually, if you if you look at the CO two that people always measure. Um, uh, coming out of the exhaust. Yeah, right? God, that then drives me mad. Then you have to add this. about twenty-five to thirty percent yeah. to get at the CO two. Um, that totally was, embedded. Uh, emitted yeah. if you include the, the 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 things you looked at, and also yeah. by the way the the, the pumping, etc. Yeah, the transportation. But, but you have to yeah. add twenty-five to thirty percent on average. There are some yeah. that are a little bit better, and then of course you have to add the fact that uh, all the uh, those tests are much more optimistic than reality. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that was one of the things that one of the questions I asked, because this the oil refinery we went to, it's in Pembrokeshire in Wales. Uh, it's quite remote. You know, it's not near a big city or anything. It's, it's, it's basically surrounded by fields full of sheep. <laughs> and it's on, an est on a kind of inlet in the sea. But it's quite, you know, it's like not an obvious place to have it because it's on the other side of the country. So a ship has got to sail all the way around Cornwall and all that, right into this little. But what, I, what they told they explained to me was the the reason it was built there was because the 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 inlet where the sea is is incredibly deep so it's this quite unusual geographical so oil oil tankers there because they are so there they are so low down there so much of an oil tanker is underwater because they are so heavy yeah, <laughs> they're, just... they're, it's, it's, it's incredible I, yeah I the scale a, of it is mind-boggling yeah. yeah i had a I had a family member and and he told me that they use bikes yes Oh yes, on, on the ships. Yeah, you know, they have to ride up and down. From one side to the yeah. other, they use bikes because yeah. otherwise it just takes too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they are huge. There was one in the dock when we were there. Uh, 
that that and that, and they're there there's the plimsoll line isn't there which i did did i remember doing at school which tells you the different salinities of of different oceans so a, a ship will r- ride lower or higher in different waters but they also have a different line i can't remember what it's called which is just the depth that of it underwater and it's meters you know there's many meters when it's empty it's meters further up out of the water yeah. than when it's full i mean it is extraordinary fascinating idea that you see such a monster yeah getting deeper and deeper yes, and deeper and up. deeper into the water and then take its massive cargo somewhere and and we've completely normalized this and yeah in a way i think it's also wonderful i mean oh it's extraordinary can do that yeah. sort of thing that we can yeah. we can yeah. So, so I, I always have this ambivalence, also, by the way, to yeah. towards the fossil fuel industry because they've they've improved so many oh, lives. Incre- they are incredibly they're efficient. Brilliant yeah. people. Yeah. And they really know what they're doing. Yeah. And on the other hand, uh, we have something new now, uh, guys. So uh, yeah. move over. So that's yes. a yeah. complicated. <laughs> it is very difficult message. Yeah. yeah. And now, what? Because the other contentious issue that I think is not going to disappear is the nuclear industry. And I and I I am quite ambivalent about that. I mean, I've always said it's the one, it's the one topic I quite enjoy sitting on the fence. <laughs> you know, not not. I, totally. I I'm also sitting on the fence. Uh, I'm not enjoying it. But no, uh, it's quite an uncomfortable fence. <laughs> yeah, for me intellectually, because I, I'm not sure. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah. And, and I like to to study things until I sort of know what position I should take. And with nuclear, I really don't know. Yeah. What I do know is that. Um, Fortunately, uh, the number of people not wanting it because they fear it, that's, that's really overblown, I think, by, yeah. the, by the nuclear lobby. They're, they're saying, oh, you don't want it because you fear it. I think there was really a 60s, very clear in 60s. Yeah. Right now, I, I'm not sure about that. But I yeah. do think that it's very expensive. Yes. It takes a long time. Yeah. So I don't, I, 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 the, in my ideal world, we we would pour a lot of money into developing nuclear, uh, both fusion and fission, because fusion is also yeah. really moving along at the moment. Also, private companies, etc., getting in, in in this space. So it's it's they say the fusion is always thirty years in the future. But at the yeah. moment, it looks it looks like it could be much sooner. Like things are really happening. Yeah. So I would say pour a lot of money into that, and then in two thousand fifty or two thousand sixty or something, we have really nice stuff to. Uh, to replace the last uh, fossil fuels or something. Yeah. And, and also when, for example, windmills that you, well, we're sort of happy with because you knew they were cleaner than coal, but didn't really enjoy uh, looking at, they could go, you know, they could simply yeah. after 30 years, they're, they're the role. So maybe just not replace it. So I'm actually not that, and there's also, by the way, ways to make a nuclear power station, also fission and certainly fusion, which basically doesn't lead to uh, 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 proliferation, you know, like yeah. people having having a much easier time making weapons and spreading weapons sort of thing. So I think nuclear is super interesting, but just saying the only thing we need is 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 a blank check of of 20 billion euros yes. or something, and we'll let you know when it's when it's when it's finished or yeah. or when we need more money. That is, I don't know. It's very. It is a simple. very. So Hinkley C, for example, yeah, keeps going. If you if it's ever in the news, if it ever gets any news coverage, it's because it's gone up another couple of billion pounds to exactly. build exactly. So yeah, and it's and also, I mean, I think the irony is there's been that you know very, I think partially inspired by America and Trump, but they sort of very big, uh, the sudden uh, incredible. Uh, uh, sympathy and empathy for the the Uyghur people in China, which is totally legitimate because what the Chinese are doing is yeah. you know deeply outrageous. But it's not the first time the Chinese government has been profoundly vile in terms of human rights. I mean, there's been a few other occasions, and we get everything made there. And you know, everybody's going. You, uh, when we cover a Chinese car, people in this country in the UK are going. Why are you promoting the Chinese Communist Party? Well, we're all paying the Chinese Communist Party a staggering amount of money because they're building Hickley Point C. You know, that's it's Chinese For money. For example, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Have you noticed how one-sided all this criticism is? You know, like cobalt, of course, the children in the cobalt mines. Yeah. How that all of a sudden is an enormous problem. 
problem yeah. to the same people who never ever noticed all the oil spills and no. all the communities all the amount of cobalt area, that was in their in their laptops and phones you know which has exactly. been the same so for decades it was decades. never a problem yeah. unless yeah. Uh, until someone started uh, getting uppity with uh, with the new technology that yeah. they uh, thought was not a part of the tribe or something. And, yes. and something like that is also going on with nuclear, I think. A lot of people who like nuclear like it because they don't like the people who like solar and wind, which yeah. I think yes. is not a good Because that's, I think, an important... Uh, and it's a hard, a hard way to travel, but it's an important one, which is, in a sense, why I won't completely go... You know, uh, 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 into a sort of an, you know profound anti-nuclear stance because I don't want to give the the obsessive <laughs> pro-nuclear people who hate renewables any breath. You know, and it's when you talk to a scientist. So one of the scientists we've interviewed on the show about nuclear fusion, his whole argument was so brilliant. He said, "Look, we all know that the first million megawatts are going to be made by renewables. It's the last." megawatt hour. how do we produce the last megawatt hour that's my worry you know the yeah. first ten thousand, easy it's going to be renewables and that's brilliant and that's what we should focus on but it's the last exactly. one which i think is you know the most interesting argument because it's clearly yeah. although although i'm one of those scientists who is in sort of the the the, the blood group who says we could do it with yes. 100 renewables no problem right but on the other hand on the other hand um um we don't have to yeah so I mean, it, it, it does get harder um, uh, once your uh, uh, adoption of renewables uh, becomes a, a larger percentage because then yeah. you need more storage, yeah. and uh, especially the last ten twenty percent of storage is more expensive, yeah. but not that expensive. So so we have options, and we should choose wisely. But we should leave this this negative. Um, you know, on on the one hand, you have a plan of the humans. You know, uh, like like yeah. nothing can we done. So let's get in my diesel again and drive home and. In, in the happy knowledge that I've demolished this this crazy idea that we can solve this, yeah. I mean, what's the point of of yeah. of, of doing that? You know, uh, of 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 basically um, shooting down all alternatives with wrong facts. Also, by the way, but okay, yeah. anyway. And on the other hand, um, we have the people who basically say nothing needs to change uh, because it's all uh, it's it's all we've always done this and it's perfect. You know, like the the a lot of climate change deniers. I think both are, are really unhelpful standpoints. Yeah. And also, um, we can actually make this world better, nicer. Yes. Uh, this, this new technology is not only uh, a solution for the climate problem. You know this cartoon, maybe, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, what, what if we go to all this effort to make the world better and it's, and it's all a con? Exactly. <laughs> We've got a better and place. Sheet, and this sheet shows... Yeah. 20 reasons or so why the world will be better. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. It's, if it's all a con? Well, you still yeah. have those 20 it's reasons. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah, absolutely so, right. So, yeah, when will people get this? That, that's my sort of mission in life, to, to yeah. hopefully make people see that, look, we can improve everything. Yes. And, and, and yes, it, it will not be the most... It will actually... It could, couldn't... Be, I mean... I'm always saying it doesn't even need to be hard. I mean, if you if you look at things like the Second World War or something, how much money, effort, sweat, blood oh, yeah. we poured into it. We don't. We're not talking about anything close to that no. level of, of of commitment or something. Yeah. I mean, so, well, so even why actually, not, what, why not make the world a better way, world a better place if it's relatively easy and yeah. cheap? Why well, I mean, I think what we've all experienced in the last, you know, the last year and a bit is the amount of, of effort and, and human sacrifice and money that we've poured into coping with a pandemic exactly. is mind boggling. I mean, the amount, yes. I mean, in particular, I mean, the unfortunate gripe in this country is the amount of, it's called the chumocracy. So the, the, the word chum means your I, pals. I follow the Guardian. So oh, so, man, so, yeah. the, the, what's been happening in this country, the corruption, the backhanded, deals are really depressing but the, just the sheer quantity of money that, that the government has somehow suddenly found and all when, those client science uh, climate scientists going like oh my yeah. god we could have solved everything with yes. this kind of money <laughs> well, i mean i can understand you know we needed we needed to deal with yes with, yes with, yes this crisis, saying, but, yeah, of yeah. course yeah and, and also um uh, one of my pet peeves so i'm not sure that you're happy about me about me talking about I this. love you peeving peeve on okay 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 you know 
COVID and a lot of other diseases like that actually get worse if we uh, eat a lot of meat. They are, they are, I'm not saying they are uh, uh, caused by, but they are certainly made worse by, and the chance of well, our, our interaction with animals, basically, exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah. zoonotic diseases. And yeah. um, one of the one of the fields I'm really excited about is cultured meat and yeah. and, 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 and plant based meat alternatives. I found that switching isn't that hard. Actually, no. losing weight is much harder than becoming vegan. I yes. found a couple of times. <laughs> But uh, uh, things are moving so fast in that space also that I'm yeah. pretty sure that in 10, 20 years, a lot of people, a lot of, you know, uh, house hockey moms will, will take clean meat because it's yeah. cheaper yeah. and because they know it's safe. Yeah. And, and, you know, this all slaughtering bit, uh, uh, yeah. I hope we will put that in the dustbin of history. Yeah. And that also has a, a, a lot of positive connotations for, for uh, uh, COVID-like uh, uh, things happening in, in the future. Yeah. Yeah. If we do that. So, yeah. Uh, no, that's not a, I don't think that's a peeve. I think that's just a statement of incredibly obvious fact based on you know, I can still, uh, you quite know a lot of data. Rifkin? You know, Jeremy Rifkin, the writer of uh, uh, The Hydrogen Economy and of Empathic Cells, he's, he used to be very, very popular, like, like let's say, a consultant, a guru um, in, in Europe. And uh, he told that 10 years ago, when he started talking about veget being a vegetarian or something, uh, you were immediately a uh, persona non grata. He, he, yeah. he, he learned very quickly that he shouldn't bring that topic up at all when he was right. talking about people with, with people about renewables, etc. He says now it's changed. Yeah. Right now it's it's completely legit, legitimate part of the of the agenda. Uh, a lot of people still don't like talking about it, but it's not a third rail anymore. Yeah. So no, I mean, I think it's a far, my experience far more in the last, so I've been, I don't know how long I've been a vegetarian, not that long, and I'm not, and I'm a lazy vegetarian, so I still have, eat cheese and eggs and milk sometimes, you know, I try and keep it down, but I do, and my daughter is a yeah. vegan and just looks ah. at me like I'm scum. But then she doesn't really look at my wife like she's scum, and she would literally bite the throat out of a cow. I mean, she's a, she's a, an Australian carnivore of the first uh, wh order. Wh wh why is that? That the people who do a little bit of good always get more flag than the people who get the, I get all the stick. So uh, it's the a few few times in the olden days, pre-COVID, where I would eat out with a group of friends, and you know, I'd have a vegetarian dish or whatever. And then the one, the person, and most people did. So my peers definitely are really? highly okay. vegetarian. And then the one who eats meat would go, I'm going to, I'm going to have the chicken. And, and they're the one who's keeping it quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I have a feeling that that it's increasingly happening. Although in my, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a peer group, not yet to that extent, I'm afraid. Yes, no, I've, and we certainly have lots of, and we live next door to a, a farmers who have cows that, you know, that in the past I have eaten. But that, yes. I mean, that's, that was yeah, but what I, I also, I, I mean, one thing I think is also very important for, for, for people who are like, uh, who have the same ideas that, that we have, is that we should not vilify the opponents no. because that, that really doesn't help. That really doesn't convince no. them of anything. Yeah. And also, it's not right because there are not so many. I mean, in Hollywood movies, there's also lots of villains. But in real life, there are not so many villains. No. There's a lot of people who do things that we think are wrong. And I think often I have the arguments to, to show them that alternatives are better. But they're not villains. They're, no. they're, so... Some of them are, but not many. Yeah, not many, no. I also had a, 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 a holiday, you know, uh, uh, work for two months or something to, to earn some money. And I went to this place where they slaughter animals. I don't know, right. slaughterhouse. Slaughterhouse, yeah. It's, it's, it's a very good way to, to motivate <laughs> yourself to become a vegetarian. Yes. So, so that was like, my yeah, theory. Was... to do it. So I, I, I don't think you're yeah. vile if you do it or something. No. So, so I don't felt morally wrong in doing it. Yeah, no. But it really helped to see... Uh, yeah. Why? Why it's a good. Yeah. It's a good I, thing. I mean, because my, my theory was that you, you know, you reach an age. I don't know, eighteen, twenty, something like that. And you, if you want to eat meat, you go to a government-run, very clean, orderly uh, slaughterhouse. But there's a special part of it. It's all tiled. It's very clean. You put on the correct clothing. They bring in a cow. They give you a, a, a captive bolt gun. You go. Well, you got to shoot it just there, right in the head. <laughs> Uh, and you go, oh. look at how many people would still eat meat. <laughs> they would be very, very Not few. <laughs> I think Paul McCartney was already right, you know, when he said that if, yeah. if Slaughterhouse would have glass walls, nobody would eat yeah. meat. 
But yeah. if you would have to do it yourself, no it's way. It's a different. Much for, for, it was a like small number of people. It's only course. our probably our great grandparents. So my even my grandparents, who were farmers, would have been used to slaughtering animals themselves. But my, you know, our great grandparents of our generation, but they would all. It would have been a day to day occurrence. Everyone but would have I still, seen. I it. still remember once we were a very young lad. There was this very powerful, very nice guy who who worked with his father at the farm. And we, we, we were biking along some, some, yeah, a pond with some ducks. And one of the ducks had a, a broken, broken leg. A broken leg, right. And he really, yeah, he looked, yeah, we, we were all feeling very sorry for it. And I still remember he was mad at us for letting that duck suffer. So right. he said, take my bike. And he <laughs> ran up to, the, to do that to the truck. <laughs> broke his neck. Broke, it, uh, broke his throat. And said, "How can you make it suffer like that?" Well, and they yeah. had calves, you know, right? Calves that that went to slaughter. Yeah. And 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 I, I was I was like, how how does this work? You yes. Know? Because yeah. he obviously cares about animals. Yeah. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, the, the, his father and he are are loving. I, I also went to his place once, and and they really loved the calves. Yes. Oh, I think who, so. Who, were, who yeah. were standing, you know, separately in, 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 in little boxes where they couldn't move. Yeah. To make veal. Oh, they were veal calves. Yeah. Yes, veal calves. Yeah, it's pretty intense. Isn't it? it is yeah, such a yeah. confusing thing, isn't it? Because it's become very remote to so many people's lives. They, you know, I worked on farms. I, him, I mean, I think, he, I mean, he, he loved them. Yeah, yeah, no, I think they do. Yeah, so, yeah. So my, how can you, how, how does that work? I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't do that in my head. <laughs> no, no. I mean, my neighbours have cattle, uh, and they—they're very—they're looked after incredibly well. I mean, in a sense, they're—they're they're the exact opposite of factory farmed beef. You know, they exactly, are exactly in in and, fields. And also, that, and, I mean, who am I to say to, to be against that? And also, some ruminants are probably good for the soil, etc. Yeah. For, for oh no, there's—I think, think there's arguments, no arguments for that. Yeah. yeah. Not at all. But anyway. But, yeah, Let's I mean, it's a, they are, they, I mean, I think the thing is, it, it, they, they are linked in a sense to the way we look at the world's uh, resources and how we use them. In a, in that sense, that if you yes. chop down yes. forest and you plant soya and you use the soy to feed <laughs> cows, and then you eat yeah. the cows, you're going, that's, no, that's, that, that's not a good way of doing it. <laughs> that, that we that we that we want to avoid when we want to avoid climate change. Yeah, but I think. For me, really, it is it is all this moonshot. I, I I really think that it was the pivotal moment, you know, uh, looking at the Earth like yeah. a blue blue marble and going like, hey, hey, we can sort of now imagine this whole thing, yeah, and maybe we can also imagine that we are really influencing this whole thing, yeah. So maybe, yeah, that makes us stewards of the world in a way, instead yeah. of just you know stupid users who say like, oh no, nothing we do might yeah. matters. Yeah. Nature will take care of itself, and and then it sort of became clear that well maybe we should take care of of this thing instead of having yeah. this unshakable faith that it will always take care of itself, even though we pollute it and use yeah. more and more and more energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think uh, yeah. I, I feel as a whole young generation uh, that's also interesting who takes this fully for granted. Yeah. Who who is so who, who basically if I tell this to them they 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 look at me like yes. When are you going to tell me something new? Yes. <laughs> and that's yeah. so wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It is a very different mindset. I mean, that's my uh, hope in a sense that, you know, just from the point of view of just purely on electric vehicles, that, the, you know, it's becoming a, a louder and louder drumbeat in my head because we're now looking at, we've just done a list of, uh, I think it's 70, I think there's 75 roughly 75 different electric vehicles now on the market uh, around the world. So not all in Europe, not all in America, but, you know, around the world, there's there's now 75 different uh, models and makes. Now, uh, you know, five, 10 years ago, there were sort of three. But what's clear is like next year, we've now got all the list we've worked out. There's about 155 wow. different yeah, it's, ones. It's happening. It, it is. It is oh, it's happening. without question, it's happening. But yes. the problem is, <laughs> so I keep thinking this going, doesn't you know if we all if the privileged people in the west of which there's many all have electric cars instead of gasoline cars it's it is better but it's still 
you know, if there'd be a street in Eindhoven where everyone's parked the bloody car, they're all electric, but they park the car, then the street's all blocked up because there's stupid cars sitting there 90% of the time not being used. You know, yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, the, 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 you know the, 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 you basically made two points. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. But, that's why but, I'm not an to, academic. To, 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 to the first point, um, uh, I, I, I really think the electric vehicles will be cheaper all the way. So oh, yeah. also yeah. in... Third one. So I think from 2025, maybe 2030, we will really see that people cannot afford to, especially in developing countries, cannot afford to buy a combustion car yeah. anymore. Yeah. And that, for me, is sort of the hope. Because, yeah, if, if just rich ex-hippies like, well, I, I wasn't really a hippie. I wasn't cool enough for that. and A little bit too young for that. <laughs> but, but, but still, if, if people like us all buy electric vehicles, that's a nice gesture, but it yeah. will not solve anything. No, no. But if through us buying them and through governments uh, subsidizing them, um, they finally become cheaper, then we're talking. Yeah. And I really think, like with solar, like with wind, that that is absolutely what's happening. So all yeah. those predictions in the future of the IPCC, for example, of all those integrated assessment models that basically go like, we will use the same amount of oil in 2100. I'm like... No, sorry, no, but you won't. really don't get it. You're really being too pessimistic. You really yeah. cannot imagine how wonderful this change away from fossil fuels is that is yeah. that is happening. So yeah. I would take heart from that. And of course, it will take time, but yeah. yeah. I mean, it is even that, you know, that uh, the thing that kind of completely pushed me and I just went, oh, this works, this is just better, is that in my life, I have, for instance, driven from the UK to friends who live in Italy. And it takes a long time. And this is in, this is a long time ago in petrol cars. You know, it takes, uh, we, I think it took us a couple of days and we stayed overnight in places and and we did it, it was fine. And then, and then uh, a couple of years ago, I drove with my wife in a Tesla to Italy, and it was absolutely the same experience. That ninety percent of the time we were driving, we were sitting in a car on a road going along, exactly, exactly, <laughs> and the, exactly. there was no stress about running out or have you got the range and all that stuff. I mean, and, and one of the experiments I did on that journey, which was less than popular with my wife, was we 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 went through Switzerland, so we'd seen some friends in Germany and then in Switzerland, and. Uh, we went, we could have gone through a tunnel. I don't know if it's the San Bernard tunnel. It's the San Bernard pass anyway, but we, and I knew we could go through the tunnel. But I went up and up and up. We went over the San Bernard pass, which I had done before, which is the second highest road in Europe. It's not, there is a, one more that's even higher, but there was, we were doing this in July, August, and there was snow. So you, that's how high you are. And it was horrible. It was five degrees centigrade, pouring with rain when we were up the top, freezing, like freezing rain. And we couldn't find a toilet. And my wife wanted to go. And we'd been driving up this winding road for hours and hours. You know? And the, the battery in the Tesla had 43 kilometers of range left. And the next but you super had it topped, you had it topped off probably before you started. Oh, we went. Uh, it was as full as I could get it because we had yeah, climbed yeah, a long exactly, way. Exactly. I went, and then, the, but I knew that the charge point was 126 kilometers away, and I was hoping <laughs> that the technology would do it because I didn't it really. Did, right? It did, right? It did. Yeah. When you know, we got you, to the drive, if you drive down so steeply, we I were think going it, down for like 150k. You know, it was just just down and down and down and down and down. It was horrendous driving. When we got to the supercharger, it was 36 degrees. So it went from five degrees to 36 degrees centigrade. So it was and how nice many kilometers did you have? Did you have left? We had 22 kilometers left when we got to the. We it was about 112. We had to do 112 kilometers, and I had 43k range ish at the top. So, oh. and that never, in a Tesla, other cars behave differently, but in a Tesla, the 43K just stayed at 43 for ages, didn't go down okay. until we got on flat ground and we drove along. And then after the last sort of 20 kilometers of the journey, it started to drop. But by then I knew we'd get there, you know, we had yeah, ample. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Driving down is a, is a, is a good way to recuperate. Right? Yeah. It's a good yeah. example of... Uh, <laughs> But I mean, that's a, that was a very extreme result. But the point is, the it's technology fine. works. It's and that's fine. what's hard to communicate to people who've never experienced it, I think, is that... that yes. And also, I found, yeah, for me, that's very strange. Uh, for me, it, it's always show me the numbers, right? I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a guy like that. 
But I found a lot of people, if I say, oh, I live in an energy positive house, I uh, have driven my car to Italy, um, yes, I, I own a Tesla myself, then they start to believe you. For yeah. me, it's always like, why does this matter? But but yeah, so yeah. I've also, also, after I wrote the books, uh, uh, driven a lot of electric vehicles, just so I could tell people I did what is that, nice. so yeah. they would take the, the data from yeah. me. So, so yeah. I, 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 yeah. So have you I, done any... Day. Any discussions, or have you been involved in any discussions around the topic of that, the kind of pain of the transition of the traditional automakers? So the people that we've been in a lot of contact with in the last sort of few years, uh, Sono Motors in, in Germany, Lightyear in the Netherlands, Tesla, obviously, Rivian in China, NIO, uh, uh, Xiaopang, you know, all those different companies that have never made combustion cars. Mm. And they're doing this step and they go, oh, we've got one that goes this far. And now we're going to make one that goes like Lucid. And, um, you know, there's vehicles being uh -huh. produced that are now well in the sort of six, 700 k kilometers range. And the, the old manufacturers, the German manufacturers, the Japanese, you know, Toyota. Uh, I, 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 what, here's, what, here's my conspiracy theory. And I absolutely acknowledge it is a conspiracy theory. It's based on emotion, not fact that you buy, um, I don't know, not a Hyundai, I'm just trying to think of a make, but a, an electric car made by a big manufacturer, and it's really much more expensive. It's 10,000 euros plus more expensive than the exact same model that has a petrol engine. Mm -hmm. And the price of batteries, as you know, <laughs> has dropped you know, very profoundly in the last 10 years, and they'll still use the excuse it costs more because of the batteries those manufacturers do and you're going well 10 years ago absolutely no argument now i'm not so sure and if you're yeah, a oh, big yeah. manufacturer that makes thousands of petrol and diesel cars but you've got to make electric ones <laughs> because of government legislation around the world well, well we, we know that um uh they they um i said it um made the release uh waited with the release of some cars after the start of 2020 because uh, that would would work out better in the subsidy scheme. In yeah. The, in the, in the, so so there is uh, certainly uh, a clear uh, a proof that that they look at those numbers. Uh, the, 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 the 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 petrol makers look at what they have to do, and sort of try to do the minimum to yeah. to, to to not pay. Yeah, and not not pay. Uh, I said it. Uh, um, Butus. Uh, they have to pay uh, these sums to the European Commission, otherwise. Yeah. Right. And they want to avoid that. Yeah. And they do the minimum to avoid that. But, yeah, so, yes, I think you're right. I think your conspiracy is probably not even a conspiracy, but, <laughs> right. but simply book it. Book it. Yeah. On the other hand, I do think it's temporary. Yes, I do. Yes, you're absolutely right. I do. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I cannot even blame them, to be quite honest. I do blame them when they tell nonsense about electric vehicles or when they say, I have a self-charging yeah. you know, yeah. hybrid. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Be serious. But, um, yeah, they have to run. Basically, we have to force them to change. It's up to yeah. us. Well, and also what's happened, what's happened in the last year with uh, vehicle sales. I mean, that is very, that is very COVID Profound, <laughs> pandemic yes. related. I mean, staggering drop in, I was actually at but a, not a drop in electric vehicles. No, so, so no it's increase. It's really yeah. clear that, that, that yeah. the transition is only sped on or only, only uh, being, being, being accelerated because of COVID. Yeah. Oh. No, I was at a, because it's a, not a thing I normally go to, but I had to go to a Hyundai dealership and service center because the hyundai kona we have had to have a software upgrade which which because if you have a if you have and that's this just classically captures the whole thing so hyundai brilliant car company i mean they're amazing and they're about to explode because they are doing a deal with apple and there's going to be amazing stuff coming out of that yeah. and new battery technology but at the moment, they build a car like they've always built a car. And what do you have to do with the car? You take it into the garage to be serviced. And that's their whole business is linked around that. Exactly the same thing happens to my Tesla. I don't even know it's happening. It just does an update over the air. The Kona, you've yeah, got to yeah, drive it in. The, the over-the-air update is something that the car makers still have to have to yeah. get used staggering. to. Yeah, staggering. Yeah. But the, way, the, the point is... Well, just quickly, the point is that I spoke to two of the people who work in the showroom, which was dead. There was no one there. No one's buying cars at the moment. And they said the only cars we're selling are the Kona, the electric oh. one. 
that's the there's nothing he said we haven't sold anything and he you know he said it is extraordinary that that, that so we, we are an extraordinary moment in time because on the other hand you also read all these reports about um for example, last week, Audi, um, uh, some Audi officials tweeted around a little little movie in, in German, basically saying electric vehicles are, are worse for the climate, blah, 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 right. the, the, old, the old stuff. So there's still very much, and, and there's also some people who tried buying cars uh, uh, in Germany, uh, you know, uh, undercover, basically. Uh, oh, the Volkswagen undercover. people, yes. And, and it's still, uh, yeah. in many uh, showrooms, it's still really hard to buy an electric yeah. vehicle. Yeah. So, uh, but on the other hand, that's what's selling now. So, yeah, their hand will be forced. Yes. It's, yeah. It's, you know, well, I'm like, glad you think that because I mean that's been my what's kept me calm. You know, if I get a, a someone very aggressive on Twitter saying, you know, just calling me lots of names and saying electric cars are, you know, whatever. I don't get upset. I mean, I've always tried not to get upset, but occasionally they can jab you and it hurts. And now I don't mind. I go, no, it's fine. Don't buy an electric car. Seriously. Just stick with your big diesel pickup truck. It's fine. Everyone else will be driving electric cars and they'll be much cheaper. But I want you to keep spending the money. <laughs> yeah, you know, because it is going to... I mean, I think that's the... losers. They're simply the losers now. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically this fight is more or less over. But it, it can still go a lot faster or slower. Oh, yeah. And a lot, a lot of... Yeah, the way I always see it for myself, a lot of species could exist if could, we split if, up a little bit. That's yes, something. yeah. I mean, that is, yes. I mean, we should really wind up now. I, all I want to say, oh, good, can we do this again? Because <laughs> I've got so many other questions I want to ask you. And, and, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you're uh, great fun to talk to. And this, no, is, uh, this is no problem to do at all. So, oh, good, uh, good. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that. It was just such a glorious natter. We had a brilliant time. I know it went on a bit, but I think it was interesting. Really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, that's all. I'm not going to go on. Normal things. Do subscribe. Do tell your mates about the Fully Charged Show podcast if you get the chance. Uh, we, we are having a lot of brilliant guests coming on. There's a lot of uh, uh, um, news episodes that I'm going to be doing for, uh, uh, for, for this uh, podcast as well coming up soon. A uh, little bit more detailed uh, look into the background of things. There's text messages flying through now. Um, it's about my wife's yoga. <laughs> That's the lockdown life. She sends me a text about doing yoga, literally in the next room there. Isn't that lovely? So romantic. Uh, that's all. I'm going to go now and make sure I don't interrupt her doing her yoga. As always, if you have been, thank you for listening. <laughs>